Bismillahirrohmanirrohim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam for all participants Praise and gratitude we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The almighty God who has given his grace so that we can gather in this event in the good condition. Welcome to all participants in this guest lecture, Nursing Management of Non-Communicable Disease in Community and Clinical Settings. This event was organized by the Faculty of Health Science, University of Muhammadiyah Malang, Nursing Department. The Honorable, Dean Faculty of Health Science, University of Muhammadiyah Malang, Dr. Yoyo Bekti Prasetyo, Magister of Nursing, Community Specialist. Our first speaker, Mrs. Heni Trirahayu, Philosophical Doctor, the Faculty, Member of Medical and Surgical Nursing Department. Our second speaker, Dr. Fiona Cathill, the Lecturer of Nursing University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom. The Honorable, all faculty members of Nursing Department, Faculty of Health Science, University of Muhammadiyah Malang, and all participants who join this lecture today. Before beginning, allow us to convey in advance the rules that please be obey during this guest lecture for the smooth running of the event until the end. Participants will use the real name while filling the link and Zoom identity. Participants fill the initial and final registration according to the specified time as a condition for obtaining a certificate. The participants are expected to take part in this guest lecture cooperatively. And for 
participants who cannot enter the Zoom meeting still can participate through YouTube. And don't forget to click and like the subscribe button. Ladies and gentlemen, starting this afternoon event, let's open together by reciting Basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's gather our focus to the opening speech from the Dean of Faculty of Health Science, University of Muhammadiyah Malang, Dr. Yoyo Bekti Prasetyo, Magister of Nursing, Community Specialist. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mrs. Juwita. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please welcome, especially Dr. Fiona Cathill, Excellencies, colleague, student, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It gives my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Faculty of Health Science the University of Muhammadiyah Malang, and say how grateful we are to our speaker who have accepted our invitation to be part of our webinar. We have here our distinguished speaker, Dr. Fiona Cathill from the University of Edinburgh. We hope the warm relationship, connectivity, and networking between uh, University of Edinburgh and UMM in other activity and uh, our faculty member, Ms. Mrs. Henny Tri Rahayu, PhD, who will share their knowledge, update, and insight with a theme of nursing management of non communicable diseases in the community and clinical field. As you might be aware, worldwide non community non communicable diseases or NCDs, and they risk factor increased vulnerability to COVID-19 infection and the likelihood of both outcome, including the younger, young, young, younger people. The pandemic has underscored the urgency of addressing NCDs and their risk factor because people with NCDs are the high risk to suffer COVID-19. Finding effective therapeutic for this patient is a high priority. On this note, I would like to thank all speakers for your time and effort to making this webinar a success. Also, we would like to invite my the participant to be actively engaged in the discuss letter. We sing all the fruitly webinar today. Today, thank you. And I am so sorry because uh, I have to agenda with the the same time, the same the same time, and especially Dr. Fiona, enjoy your class in UMM. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi Thank you for the opening speech. Now. Let's continue to the main agenda. We have two panel sessions. The first session about management non-communicable disease in clinical settings will be delivered by Mrs. Hani Trirahayu, Doctor of Philosophy. She is an expert of medical and surgical nursing and the faculty member of nursing department who is already graduated from National Chengkung University of Taiwan. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite our moderator of the first session, Mrs. Angraini Dwi Kurnia. We invite you to lead the stage. Hello, Ms. Juwita. Can you hear my voice clearly? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Ms. Juwita. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 
Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Honorable, the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Muhammadiyah, Malang. Uh, the Honorable of the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Muhammadiyah, Malang. And the Honorable, our distinguished guests, lecturers, students, and all the participants. It's been a great honor for me, uh, Angraini Dwi Kurnia, or you can call me Nia, to be a moderator for this session. And welcome and every one of, uh, of you in this virtual guest lecture. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in this session, we have approximately an hour uh, for getting knowledge from our speakers. And we have the question and answer sessions. Okay, for today, the speaker will deliver her scientific lecturers. Uh, we're talking about the non-communicable disease, diabetes nursing care in clinical setting. Uh, before we start, let me introduce our beautiful speakers. Okay, so maybe Mr. Zaki, would you please uh, share screen the CV from our speakers? Okay, I will read the curriculum vitae for our speakers today in the first session. Name Heni Tri Rahayu, SCAP nurse MS PhD. Uh, she already married and currently uh, she is a lecturer of the Faculty of Health Science, University of Muhammadiyah Malang. Uh, especially in medical and surgical nursing. And she just graduated from the PhD program from the International Doctoral Program in Nursing National Chengkung University. And also for uh, her master degree, she also graduated from the NCKU, Taiwan. And then, uh, Here's a lot of uh, experience about her. And for her majoring, uh, she is focused on the medical surgical nursing, chronic disease, non-communicable disease, self-efficacy theory and applications, self-management education program, chronic disease care, and also psychometric testing. Uh, I think she also uh, outstanding Lecturer, that's right. Uh, she already a scholarship both in magister and for doctoral degrees come from uh, Dikti or Indonesian government. And right now, they are she have uh, ongoing projects uh, such as uh, let's see, yeah, such as a uh, psychometric testing of Indonesian person diabetes self-management and a lot of many projects that are uh, already run by her. Okay, this is if you would like to know much about her, you can directly ask her if uh, she has finished to leave for the speech. Okay, all right, without any further to do, I would like to welcome the presenters. Hello, Miss Henny Rahayu, Henny Tri Rahayu. Hello. Okay, hello, okay, good. Okay, Mrs. Henny Tri Rahayu, please. Okay. Uh, uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Miss? Yes. We can hear you clearly, Miss Henny. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's honor to be here that I uh, have the 
opportunity to share a little uh, uh, science about the what 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 the I know about the diabetes care, especially in the non-communicable disease. Uh, firstly, I want to share first my PPT. Yes, uh, thank you for all the committee members that I uh, know that uh, I have to for uh, to present my PPT now. Okay, uh, talking about non-communicable disease, which is uh, this is related to the most uh, problem in the worldwide, not only in our country but also worldwide. And. Before we talking about the non-communicable disease, we should have like knowing about what are the non-communicable diseases. As uh, we know in the reference, uh, non-communicable disease is a disease that is not transmirable, transmirable which is directly from one person to another. And this is uh, NCDs include like uh, Parkinson's disease, autoimmune, strokes, most heart disease, most cancer, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, COBD, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, and also another kind of uh, disease in the chronic disease, especially. Usually, uh, non-communicable disease is in could be chronic and also acute. But uh, we know that uh, the key factor of the non-communicable disease, which is non-communicable disease is kill about 41 million people each year, which is, is equivalent to about 71% of the all that globally. And each year, more there are more than 50 million people die from the NCD between the age 30 to uh, 69 years old. And it's uh, reach uh, about 85% uh, of this premature death occur in low and middle income country, including in our country, Indonesia. As um, WHO reported that uh, cardiovascular disease is account for most uh, non-communicable disease death, which is, is a reach about 70.9 million people People annually died from the cardiovascular disease and followed by the cancer, respiratory disease, and also diabetes is alone. The, there are uh, these four groups of disease account for over 80% for all premature death and CD death. And uh, WSO also reported that the tobacco use, physical inactivity, the harmful of the use of the alcohol, and also a healthy diet all increase the risk of dying from the non-communicable disease. And the de detection, screening, and treatment of the NCDs, as well as palliative care, uh, are the key component of the response to the non-communicable disease itself. As uh, we see in the chart here, this is the global death under age of the 70 years old, which is uh, non commodities occupy about uh, 52%. This is in the WHO report in 2014. And cardiovascular itself has reached uh, 37% of all deaths. And this is, uh, we talk about the non-communicable disease, as I uh, mentioned previously. This is related to the behavior risk and the me uh, metabolic, uh, also psychological causes. For example, uh, the first is about to tobacco use. This is the tobacco use is like a um, problem, uh, not only worldwide, but also in, this is the biggest problem in Indonesia because our community is still high prevalent in the tobacco tobacco use. And the second uh, behavior is, uh, is like it's insufficient physical activity. Also, we have uh, this kind of big problem in here because nowadays there is uh, the increase of the prevalence of the obesity and also diabetes itself. And the third is about the harmful, harmful use of the alcohol and the unhealthy diet because as we know, uh, there are so many kind of the food, unhealthy food that's provide in the modern era. And this is, uh, this, the third is about the uh, raised blood glucose pre blood pressure, which is, is lead to the uh, cardiovascular disease and also kidney uh, failure. 
And another problem is about the overweight and obesity is related to insufficiency physical inactivity and also rise cholesterol is also uh, related to the unhealthy diet and the rise is about the cancer associated infection. It is also uh, one of the biggest uh, problem in the non communicable disease, not only worldwide but also in Indonesia. Uh, this chart here is uh, mentioning about the main contributory factor to high blood glucose pressure and its complication, which is uh, we know that from the social determinant like uh, globalization, urbanization, aging, income, education, and also housing is related to, to the behavior risk and also with all of the uh, unhealthy diet. Uh, unhealthy uh, behavior is uh, lead to the metabolic risk factors such as like uh, high blood pressure, like obesity, diabetes, and also right lipids, lipid. And also the finally it will uh, cause of the cardiovascular disease, which is usually patient will have the heart attack, stroke, and also heart failure. And nowadays, WHO uh, have the action plan. Uh, this is uh, about the how global NCDs action plan from the 2013 and until 2020, which is there are nine global targets for the NCDs by the 2025. Uh, uh, for example, like in here, in the first, uh, the WHO is uh, expected that we can uh, reduce the the uh, cancer and also the cardiovascular disease and the number and then also we can reduce the use of the alcoholic harm from the alcoholic use and also relative reduction in the prevalent insufficiency activity which is uh, this is still uh, as i mentioned previously it is still a high problem in our country and also the use of the salt or sodium which is uh, lead to the high blood pressure and also the tobacco use and, uh, and another diabetes and obesity and so on. And for the field for the uh, discussion, we will talk uh, specifically for to the diabetes. I choose the diabetes because uh, in a reference and also in our funding that diabetes is a one of the biggest global challenges in the 21st century, which is diabetes is a common threat that regardless the border and social class. It means that there is no country that can avoid diabetes, even in Indonesia. Now it is a growing faster in diabetes number, which is, as we know, about 2045, uh, there are about uh, 629 million people have diabetes worldwide. And in uh, but in 2040, which is uh, WSO estimated that one of 10 adults will have diabetes. So it is a higher problem. And also why we choose diabetes? Because uh, diabetes is uh, one of the leading cause of many kinds of the disease. For example, also like this is in, in the cataract, it's also non-communicable disease and also periodontal and also person with the people with diabetes had two to three uh, times more likely to have cardiovascular disease. And also there are three, uh, 10 times higher in the prevalence of the ESRD or end-state renal disease or CKD. And also we have like uh, amputation. There are 30 seconds of the lower, uh, every 30 seconds, there are one of the lower limb part is lost to the, the diabetes. And how about the epidemiology? Uh, diabetes itself in Indonesia, the number is still higher, which is in uh, 2045, we estimated, uh, WHO estimated that Indonesia has occupied sixth rank, which is a uh, country have the top uh, number of diabetes. And also which is, uh, it is, although the rank is uh, lower in compared to the, 27 in 2045, but the number here is still higher, it increases. And Indonesia is uh, the number of the due to, due to the diabetes uh, in 1000 people is up reach, uh, prevalent is 114.1 uh, uh, people. It means that one, uh, 100 people is has, uh, uh, this is the higher prevalent in the number of that due to the diabetes. 
And I want to try to uh, review a little review that uh, what uh, is diabetes. As a um, reference, say that diabetes is chronic disease that um, occur either when pancreas does not produce insulin or when the body cannot effectively use the insulin it pro it produces. And this is the insulin is or as we know that it's a hormone that regulates blood sugar, and this is the effect that uh, in diabetes, which is uh, usually is signed as a hyperglycemia or rise blood sugar, it, it is a common effect of uh, uncontrolled diabetes and over time lead to serious damage to many of the body system, especially in the nerve and also body facial uh, blood vessel. And as uh, the American Diabetes Association guideline in uh, the, the latest one, uh, I just uh, the, the, the latest guideline is about in 2021, uh, is published in June 2021. And this is the type of diabetes currently, which is has the type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which is informally, it is called an EDDM or non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. But currently, we do, we do not use this uh, it, uh, the, the term because uh, for, there are also so many people with type 2 diabetes is dependent to uh, insulin. And the third uh, type is gestational diabetes. And also the fourth is, uh, as in, in the WSO website, we can find the fourth is about the, it is the pre diabetes, impaired glucose or, or IGT. And, also impaired fasting glucose in IFG. However, if we see in the uh, American diabetes uh, guideline, the fourth uh, type is about the specific type of diabetes due to the other causes. For example, like monogenic diabetes syndrome, such as uh, neonatal diabetes, maturity onset diabetes of the young, and also disease of the exocrine pancreas, like kisti uh, probiotic pancreatitis, and, and so on and also drug or chemical induced diabetes. It is also uh, be part of the type uh, diabetes in the fourth type. And for the next uh, discussion, we will talk uh, closely to the type two diabetes because uh, this is most common diabetes form uh, that we can find in the hospital uh, in currently. Um, before we talk about diabetes, we should know uh, how we can diagnose the diabetes itself. Based on the American Diabetes Association, uh, diabetes may be diagnosed based on the plasma glucose criteria. It's plasma like the FFG or fasting plasma glucose and also 20 hour uh, plasma glucose uh, value, which is uh, from the OGGT. OGGT is an oral glucose tolerance test, which is we, we give the patient uh, about a 25 gram oral glucose, which is uh, in uh, uh, for it, uh, maybe in we salute in the about uh, one glass of the uh, water. And also the latest one is we use uh, should have the A1C or criteria. And this is the criteria based on the American Diabetes Association. So for example, like this, uh, fasting glucose, F uh, like this. Uh, I think that we should know, knowing about this, because when we found it in, in the hospital for our patient, we can just have like screening, find a screening in here. And how about uh, asymptomatic adult, which is this last, for the pre-diabetes, uh, uh, the first F we found that uh, adult with overweight or obesity, for example, like our BMI is of over 25 kilo per milli uh, quadrant or the 20 uh, kilo for the ASEAN American. So it's like we have one or more following risk factor. If we have one or more for the following risk factor, which is like we should have aware, which is maybe uh, the patient have the high risk of the diabetes, maybe on the pre uh, diabetes uh, stage. For example, like first degree relative, it means that maybe our we have like the 
mother, father, brother, which is uh, have diabetes also is uh, the point is one. And also the high risk race, for example, like African, na native Asian or Asian American, which is uh, the combination from the Asian and American people is high risk in the race acidity. And also someone who has the history of the cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and also SGL cholesterol level is low. And also women with uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, physical inactivity, and other clinical conditions such as like uh, severe obesity and also acantoric nigricans. Acantosis nigricans is about like uh, where there are the uh, the change of the pigmentation in the body usually is uh, with the sign of that. And the second uh, sign is about the consideration about the patient with prediabetes is if we found uh, the patient have the A1C is uh, over 4.7%. And we, so it is be tested yearly and also women with the uh, uh, diagnosed with GDM or gestational diabetes mellitus. And also the beginning age of the 45 years. So most persons with uh, 45 years old should be testing. And also the, if, if the results are normal, so it's minimum three year interval will be uh, retested again. And also the last is about the HIV. HIV fashion is autoimmune disease, which is uh, maybe is lead to diabetes type two. This is the table that we can compare uh, the criteria from the screening and diagnosed in diabetes, which is uh, compared with pre-diabetes and also diabetes itself. For example, like in if we found A1C of our patient is more than uh, 6.5, so it is positive diabetes, but if less than 6.5% uh, is uh, still pre-diabetes. And how about the uh, sign of the diabetes itself? we should be aware of if we have like we have obesity or overweight and yes and we also find about the always thirsty frequent urination numbness sexual problem maybe brutally present now say sudden weight loss or maybe one that wouldn't heal and also always hungry and also feel tired so we should aware because we have the high risk of maybe have the diabetes stage and this is we go to the diabetes management actually because diabetes is chronic illness that requires there are so many kind of the management not only in diabetes management we cannot have like a uh, what alone? I mean, like for example, like only medication, only diet, and also maybe on uh, in, in it alone. But the in diabetes management, we should have all of together. And for example, we include the education, patient education, evaluation from micro and muscular complication, uh, attempt for achieving the normal glycemia, avoidance for the drugs, exacerbate, and also minimization of the cardiovascular risk. And this is the treatment goal in the hospital that uh, we found uh, in the guideline, the American Diabetes, uh, the latest guideline, which is uh, the diabetes management, glycemic management is reasonable for goal for therapy, must be A1C value less than 0.7 because 7.0 uh, uh, 7 is percent is uh, the, the threshold that it is a good uh, for the patients. Because every one percent drop, uh, the evidence suggests that every one percent drop in glucose hemoglobin or A1C is associated with improved outcome over the long term of the no threshold effect. And also, we we try to uh, evaluate the cardiovascular risk factor. For example, like we uh, figures cardiac risk reduction, like most. Uh, smoking decision, but pressure control, reduction in serum lipid, diet, exercise, and weight loss, and also using the aspirin as this is uh, beneficial for diabetes. Okay, next we move to the diabetes care in the hospital. Uh, this is the hospital delivery standard that uh, provided by American guideline. This is a per, uh, person who should be uh, have the A1C test on the all person is uh, with diabetes or hyperglycemia, 
admit to hospital if not perform in the prior team or so A1C test is most uh, the the first uh, choice for the diagnosis in diabetes and use the insulin um, so administered using the validated right and computerized like this is uh, this is the one of the uh, initial or the uh, first choice in uh, treatment in diabetes in the hospital. And as I, as I put here, there is a SB1C indicator for diabetes control, which is the, uh, the green one. The green one is uh, so that about this is the low risk or good control of diabetes. And, the, and also the intensive intravenous insulin regimen is uh, reduce mortality by 40% compared with the standard approach targeting by glucose of the patient, which is the critically ill patient and also recent surgery. So it's important to notice. Um, before we go to the, the, we say that about the initial pharmacologic therapy, which is A1C or above target level pharmacologic therapy using the uh, at the time of diabetes diagnosis with life modification. This is the, the base or the uh, continual uh, basic uh, uh, approach for the diabetes initial pharmacology, which is FB. We found that there is a symptomatic non catabolic patient. For example, like we thought polyuria, polydipsia, or unintentional weight loss. So it is only uh, use the oral diabetes agent, for example, like metformin, or also vanilorea. But uh, this is why we, uh, the guidelines say that metformin is the preferable initial therapy because uh, this is like uh, for the, the low cost of the diabetes uh, for the patient and also very cheap. And also this is uh, the efficacy is good. But if there are some symptomatic or catabolic or severe hyperglycemia, so the pharmacologic therapy should have the insulin or GLP-1 receptor agonist. As I mentioned previously, the diabetes should have the education. Uh, many evidence suggests that patients with newly diagnosed should have participated in a comprehensive diabetes self-management education program because it's a... Uh, Diabetes patient, uh, the main uh, management is from their self because we are as a healthcare provider is only helping the people, but uh, the key point is the patient is self. So uh, in the comprehensive diabetes self-management education, we should include the medical nutrition therapy, for example, like weight reduction that is uh, reducing the calorie intake, increasing physical activity, behavior modification, and also uh, diet, exercise, which is uh, evident also found that the regular exercise improved glycemic uh, management due to the increase uh, responsive to insulin. For example, like uh, aerobic exercise or the resistant training if there is no contraindication. And the intensive lifestyle modification, psychological intervention, also pregnancy. Now we move to the what insulin itself. Insulin for diabetes is generally correct to correct high glucose, uh, blood glucose or blood sugar. There is uh, evidence say that one unit of insulin is needed to drop the blood glucose by 50 milligram per dl, which is range 30 or uh, to 100 milligram per dl or more, depending on the individual insulin sensitivity and or the other cisco numbers. As we know previously, maybe uh, you have a uh, knowing about the kind of the insulin itself. There is regular insulin, NPH, and also analog insulin, which is analog insulin is the recomb recombinant DNA technology, which is, is widely used currently in the world, right? Because uh, this is uh, the efficacy is good and also this have the uh, very good, it's better than the regular and also NPH insulin. Which is, uh, as we know that the, the base of the insulin uh, administration is for the uh, subcutaneous injection. However, it also can be insulin pump or IV regular insulin. And as we found in the hospital, for example, uh, 
for the clinically or critically patient diabetes, usually a doctor or physician has the treatment for the intravenous insulin infusion, which is called VREE, which is a variable rate intravenous insulin infusion. This indication is if uh, the disease pump, the pump insulin is used, the uh, patient in with type 1 diabetes who are unable to eat and drink, maybe type 2 diabetes, but also have tests. Uh, also, patient with uh, type 1 diabetes recurrent vomiting, uh, and also patient type 1 or 2 diabetes with several illness, such as uh, sepsis. So, if we found uh, in the hospital, maybe in our clinical practice, we found that patient diabetes have sepsis. So, the, the initial or the choose uh, the first choice for the treatment is intravenous infusion insulin. This is the practical aspect they're prescribing for the VRGEE. Uh, for example, like with hot uh, usual diabetes treatment, for if patients have this, in, this infusion, and usually the, the infusion only had the uh, actrapid, which is, is a rapid act, uh, because only rapid acting or regular insulin can be uh, administered by uh, intravena. And also, we, as a nurse, we should always ensure that our patient, which is with uh, VREE, use the substrate or uh, the fluid is dextrose. It's prescri prescribed in with uh, VREE to prevent the risk of the hypoglycemia, which is intravenous insulin infusion should not be administered without substrate unless they're undertaken in critical care setting or you want senior advice. And when well, our patient have the VREE, uh, the CBG or, or the capillary blood glucose level must be monitored hourly. So it's every hour we should check the, the capillary uh, blood glucose level. And we should have the review for the patient within six hours. And if the uh, uh, CBG is approximately about 20, uh, 12 mill millimol per liter or maybe it's above uh, if in the mini gram per liter is about uh, 20, 250 or 240 around that, because one of the millimol is uh, equivalent to 1.8 uh, milligram per deciliter. Is if we check the ketone is four hours for the type one diabetes, but for the type two, at least we should have the check the ketone at least once. And this is the fluid. Uh, choices for the administrate VRE or in, uh, infusion insulin, which is most of them is like use the combination of the natrium chloride and also dextrose, which is for example, it is this first is like uh, a half in NS in uh, five uh, five percent glucose in a half NS, which you can see. Uh, but um, as we should have the uh, aware about the key or the potassium uh, levels in our VREE patients, because usually patients will have the lose, lose their uh, uh, potassium level. So we just have this, like, this kind of the awareness. And this is the rate, how, how, how fast how, or how, uh, how much we can uh, have the fluid infusion. It depends on the fluid status on the patient. If, if there is no risk of fluid overload substrate, uh, we can have the about 125 milliliter per hour. And also if a patient with high risk of the fluid overload or frail or elderly use 5% or 10% dextrose, which is only about 80 milliliter per hour. And consider higher strength of substrate it means that we use higher concentrate of the dextrose or glucose at the lower uh, milliliter per hour. And for the monitoring of the capillary blood glucose, well, uh, it is uh, has the this hour basis, and also the ABG above the target is ring, like something like this. You can uh, see uh, the detail in the guideline if you want. But be aware that, uh, about the hypoglycemia in the patient with the VREE because uh, I ever have an experience when uh, I was in the work in the hospital. Uh, my college has the 
uh, if we are e and then c uh, is like uh, wrong set the infus pump so it's like a patient directly have the hypoglycemia which is it is very dangerous for our patient because it's life threatening and so if you found a patient with the hypoglycemia on vree so just stop the vree and then uh, treat the hypoglycemia and also step down the lower scale or customize the scale of the vree and restart to prevent the further hypoglycemia and this is the commonly error that we can find. This is the error from the physician or the doctor. Usually they have maybe is pres prescribing VRE without substrate, as I mentioned, because uh, because substrate about the like the use the fluid of the dextrose, the wrong insulin infusion rate, or maybe background insulin is not continued alongside and delay the VRE starting errors. And from error from the nursing, usually we can first use the VRE infusion pump with no label. We don't have the label on it or maybe insulin expired. And also the accident done overdose due to the setting in correct palm rate. This is uh, so uh, often we have the nursing error here and also accident and disconnecting of the infusion and poor CLBG monitoring because then somehow we just only one or two times to uh, measure or to monitor the CBG's documentation. And also we have maybe have error IV or IC switch, which is usually uh, VREE is uh, IV administered, not as a uh, subcutan. And uh, this is the latest, uh, we found that insulin pump therapy, which is uh, here. This is the name or uh, continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion, which is uh, in the maybe in the in the abroad, maybe in the for example, I, I found that in the patient in the Taiwan also have like uh, in my experience have this this device and some people uh, have this uh, insulin pump C S E E is. Uh, to use the insulin so that they don't need to have uh, every hour or every uh, period to inject by uh, manually. So it just wants, this is uh, the, 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 the principle is about the basal insulin. So uh, insulin that we use in this CSEE is uh, the basal insulin, for example, like uh, NGPH, which is a middle uh, or intermediate acting. This is the second type of the insulin patch is, is named insulin patch pump, which is only a patch this, it is the subcutaneous, and then the patient have control this uh, device from this wearable wireless of the from the uh, mobile phones. So just like this. This is the uh, basal rate and also uh, the doses. And about the troubleshooting, usually we, we have pump failure for, for, uh, due to the detachment, blockage, or leakage of the infusion set, or connector, or causing interruption, and also insulin flow. And uh, also somehow we can find that superficial infection, although it's rarely, but maybe uh, infusion set has not been changed, maybe for the more than 72 hours, if the site was not properly prepared or infusion set is not properly inserted. And we should also have the NPO procedure in this uh, TSEE, usually uh, still have the basal infusion rate is still continued. And this is the uh, some uh, uh, point that we can find when our patient in the operative care, which is uh, here about the metformin, about the, the target range, blood glucose, and so on. And for the diabetes ketoacidosis and also hyper or smaller, usually uh, we have individualization of treatment because a different patient has their own different preference and also uh, clinical condition and also laboratory assessment. And this is management goal restoration about the goal is about re restoring the circulation volume, resolution hyperglycemia, correcting electrolyte imbalance and also acidosis and also important treat for the uh, critically ill patient and mentally ill uh, patient which is used continuous intravenous insulin as a standard care. And this is the additional uh, 
uh, assessment that I gave for the food diabetes that we can uh, assess to our patient in the hospital. Uh, for example, we try to knowing the assess the maybe the the uh, how to say this uh, about the uh, two or maybe for example how more to charge or join uh, in two nail halo falcus corn falcus and so on and this is one of the uh, monofilament test which is also, it's only a simple guide in here, only use the monofilament, but it has uh, efficacy to screening for the neuropathy for our patients. And this is uh, compared to the dependent reflect test, uh, monofilament is uh, good, uh, better for the neuropathy. And also, this is the uh, angiopathy, like pulsacy artery dysosipedis. This is like Doppler here being used to detect the dorsalis pedis pulse, like the ankle brachial pressure induct, we can uh, use this um, ratio ankle systolic. And this is also the Wagner classification for wound, which is uh, management and uh, goal is for acute and chronic prevention. And for the ischemic full ulcer, usually we want to reduce the cultivator disease and also refocalization of the this kind of wounds. And this is uh, the common site for the neuropathic ulcer. For uh, We can use the cast of loading source, cast of loading source, or also crutches to uh, reduce body weight of load. And also, for example, we use this cast here to reduce the plantar flexion tension. And also, we can apply the wound debridement uh, to remove callus or neuropathic food, dry exuded, and so on. And this is like maybe we can use the macotherapy for the debridement and also biofoam dressing. And uh, uh, is, I already know that this is the one, the newest one, that is the PRC or Pacom Acids PAM, uh, which is innovation assist to wound closure, which is use, uh, applying negative pressure to wound uh, using the tube here. This is so the last one. Uh, prior patient go home, or we should have prepared the hospital discharging, which is uh, include uh, many kind of education. We should uh, aware of uh, about the efficacy of healthcare provider who will provide the diabetes care after discharge, level of understanding of sub monitoring, and also definition of the hyperglycemia and also hypoglycemia and also treatment and making healthy food choices, or also maybe take blood glucose, at, uh, which is uh, safety management and proper use of the disposal of needle. This is the reference that can, uh, maybe you can go to them. It's uh, the latest uh, books, textbook, and also the guideline. Most of, most of them is uh, published uh, in 2020 and 2021. So you can try to read it. And there are so many kind of the reference from diabetes. Maybe that's all my presentation. And thank you. I, I give the time to moderator. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Henny, for giving such uh, informative and interesting presentations. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, right now we come to the question and answer sessions. You can directly ask to the speaker or you can write down in the chat. Uh, in the chat. Okay, right now we have uh, Bu Lestari, Mrs. Lestari. Hello, Mrs. Lestari, Bu Lestari. Bu Lestari is here. Bu Lestari, would you like to... Uh, deliver your answer directly to our speaker today. Hello? Okay, so I will read uh, her question. Hello? Pulestari? I can open. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Would you like to directly deliver your Questions to our speaker. 
Yes, uh, I think uh, enough in uh, in in chat. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you for the study. I will read uh, your question in the chat. Okay, for the first questions come from Bu Lestari. She asked about uh, during the pandemic, are there any change condition about non-communicable disease and how about nursing management for non-communicable disease during pandemic? Uh, for our speaker, Mrs. Henny, would you like to answer uh, answers directly or we collect it first? Answer. 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 Oh, okay, please. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, Ibu Lestari for the questions. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, yes, uh, about the question is about uh, during the pandemic, uh, what are the change in condition in non-communicable diseases? Of course, uh, the during pandemic, especially in now in uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the people who suffer in non-communicable diseases, for example, like diabetes, cancer, is higher or vulnerable in the, the COVID-19. Uh, so there are so many guidelines that uh, we should have the different treatment, different um, uh, attention, which is a uh, person who and without the non-communicable disease in our uh, patient, maybe in the clinical setting. For example, uh, WHO also uh, have found that there are so many other American diabetes association also provide a guideline special for the diabetes in the COVID-19 pandemic, which is uh, because as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic is a uh, higher prevalent and also just uh, disturb the, the uh, immune and diabetes patient, for example, he have the, uh, the low immune for this. So it's high risk for the COVID-19. And usually uh, in my experience in the, and I found in the uh, Taiwan as I uh, learned there, uh, for the COVID-19, especially for the cancer patient, maybe uh, for the uh, H, uh, diabetes itself, uh, in hospital, there are, they have their own lane when we go into the hospital. So that is not a special for the diabetes patient. And also they have lane uh, different ex, uh, entry hospital. This is, uh, we uh, have like a uh, patient who come, which is with the comorbidity, uh, for example, diabetes, also high, high hypertension and so on. This has their, their the, the entrance, uh, special entrance in the hospital because it's to reduce the risk to uh, uh, spreadness of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, in the normal patient. On the normal patient and also in the hospital which have a very very tight which is a uh, patient uh, with the comorbidity uh, cardiovascular disease and also uh, diabetes patient which is uh, when patient have this kind infection i mean the covid 19 uh, the prognosis is very fast to be uh, done great it's like uh, very bad so and also uh, mostly patient with uh, comorbidity with it with uh, for example in the diabetes patient have the infection of the uh, COVID nineteen uh, have died uh, because of the some kind of complication. So very very uh, in the hospital we just uh, very tight. Uh, to treat the patient with this this one, especially in the comorbidity. Hopefully, okay. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you for your yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, full study for your question, and we have a uh, good explanations for our speaker today. And right now we come to the. Ms. Henny, our vice dean in the Faculty of Health Science. Hello, Ms. Henny. Could Hello. You please, yeah, could you please deliver your answer? Okay. Uh, your questions. You. Okay, please. Okay. Uh, hello, Ms. Henny. 
see you again in Indonesia. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Congratulations with your thank PhD you. graduate. Okay, uh, I have some question. I know that uh, there was COVID-19 virus confirmed to have spread to Indonesia on 2 March 2020. And then as of uh, 5 December 2020, I think that I have uh, more than 4 million. 4 million case of COVID-19 and our uh, our country is highest in the Southeast Asia. And based on the previous research also older people and people with the existing medical conditions such as uh, diabetics and then heart disease and asthma appear to, to be more uh, vulnerable to becoming safely, safely ill with the COVID-19 virus. And uh, when people with diabetes develop a viral uh, infection, it can be harder to treat due to fluctuation in blood glucose levels. And I think the presence of diabetes complication uh, based on this background and this condition in our country, we, we know that we as nurses in the frontline area, what should nurses do with this condition and how about with the uh, family role? Thank you. Mia, langsung. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Henny, for the very good question and also a very uh, good evidence base. Yes, of prior the your question here. Yes, I do agree. That is. Uh, the family roles is very important to uh, have the patient with the many condition. For example, in the non-communicative disease such as diabetes or, uh, or maybe the uh, history of the cardiovascular disease and also asthma and so on. Because uh, as we know that COVID-19 is uh, like very fast or very uh, easy to uh, spread uh, between each other so because this is one of the biggest uh, pandemic on one of the biggest uh, infection that very mo most most uh, country in the world what is very very tough uh, uh, against this disease so this here the, the family uh, real law is very important in because family can support because uh, in especially for diabetes patient, for example, in our uh, uh, community, uh, without the family uh, support, for example, that uh, for the medication, for the because uh, maybe uh, because this pandemic they cannot do another activity for uh, to exercise, go out, so that the family can have uh, maybe provide another type of the supporting for the exercise, keep, keeping exercise in ho at home together, or maybe can have together to uh, control the spreadness of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also maybe like uh, supporting for the diet, the choosing the uh, uh, medication and also choosing the uh, nutrition. It's very good for the patient because as we know, the patient uh, with uh, high uh, diabetes condition or severe diabetes condition or maybe another condition, uh, high blood glucose and also high hypertension is like uh, related to the uh, daily activity, daily life uh, uh, influence such as uh, nutrition, eating eating uh, disorder and something like on. So yeah, as, as our, if we have the family, with uh, the vulnerable risk or uh, they have like uh, diabetes, we should have supporting, including the how we can very start uh, for the spreadness of the COVID-19. We can support the immune using the uh, supporting nutrition and also maybe a supplement or something else. This, this is the, my understanding and my question about this. Mrs. Henny. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Henny. Uh, is there any feedback uh, from Miss Henny? Yes, yes. Okay. Could I? Okay, Could yes, of course. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, thank you, Miss Henny, with your explanation. I think it's good explanation and clearly. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, 
uh, you you already explained about the diet and then about the uh, uh, medication and activity and so on. And I I follow your uh, explanation from your PPT PowerPoint. I also interested with your uh, application web. I think it's like uh, you explain to us about that application. It's like how how the patient to control their uh, uh, glucose uh, glucose level is like that. Is possible to use it for our country? Yes, thank you. Uh, for the latest uh, over the advanced device, uh, as I I I'm, uh, presenting in the my uh -huh. PPT, it is the GSEE is like a continuous insulin pump for the patient. This is uh, the latest. However, I. I still maybe very rare in Indonesia. Still, still not not found the body this this kind of device. But actually, in somehow uh, in the because it's like the high little higher cost for the patient mm -hmm. because this is yes, a patient can control the result and also the pump uh, injection. So for a patient only can put the patch in the uh, subcutan and then this have long every uh, two or twenty four hours. Uh, insulin pump via uh, subcutaneous, which is this, this uh, patch, and just control it. The result in this uh, wearable, like say, for example, in the uh, mobile phone. Yes, this is. Uh, but actually, I I surely uh, uh, that maybe uh, not in far time. Maybe uh, it's closely we can have this in because uh, not really high. I mean, not, not, not really expensive. I think it's good for the next, uh, maybe for our patient. But currently, it's still very rare, honestly. Okay, thank you. It's good. Uh, it's good. Oh, I can see. <laughs> maybe it's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is <laughs> because yeah. you know, as you know, uh, our country is uh, left behind with is compared to the another country. Even in Taiwan, we, we just uh, like left in twenty years left behind from Taiwan into yes. small island. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Miss Henny. Thank you. Okay, thank you for both Miss Henny and Mrs. Henny. Okay, uh, brief, uh, previously I show uh, Sania click the right hand symbol. Do you like to deliver your question, Sania? Hello? Hello, Sania? Okay, maybe, maybe I have uh, one question left. To our student, please uh, take this opportunity to uh, explore your experience or your knowledge to our speaker today. One of you, maybe our students. No one. <laughs> okay, because uh, the time uh, is up, and now we are going to the end part. Uh, the end of the part. Uh, before we close this part. Uh, Mrs. Henny, would you like to give some close statement to our participant? Yes, uh, thank you, Budia. Uh, uh, my, my close statement is like, uh, because we are nurses, or maybe you are uh, the, the future nurses, which is uh, you, you, you can be an agent of change uh, in the, our healthcare uh, professional in the future. So just uh, take your time to uh, uh, more read, 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 read many kind of resources, uh, especially related to the, our clinical condition, because it is very useful when you, uh, all of you are, has a clinical, clinically practice in the hospital and maybe in the future, which is uh, in your uh, future career. So it's like uh, there is no, uh, time or maybe um, long life learning, something like that. I, I mentioned it. There is no limit to uh, learning. Keep going. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Henny. So please give applause for our speaker today. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, hopefully the uh, this guest lecture in the first part will be beneficial for everybody. Okay, I mean. 
Okay, uh, right now uh, I will bring it back to MC and this is part for me. Uh, Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, I'll bring it back to MC, Miss Juwita. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Miss Anggraini Dwi Kurnia for the moderate, as the moderator today. Now, let us continue to the second agenda. The second panel about management non-communicable disease in community settings will be delivered by Dr. Fiona Katil, the lecturer of nursing faculty, University of Edinburgh, Unif United Kingdom. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite our moderator of the second session, Mrs. Indah Dwi Pratiwi, we invite you to lead the stage. Thank you, Kuju Rita. Okay, since our second guest speaker is not arriving yet at our Zoom meeting, so um, please give uh, probably five minutes to it for our second guest speakers. Okay, participant, if you want to um, drink a cup of coffee or uh, you want to go to the restroom while waiting for our second guest speaker.
love UMM. I 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 love UMM. We love UMM. I love UMM. I love UMM. I love. I love. I love UMM. UMM dari Muhammadiyah untuk bangsa. Halo, Dr. Fiona Kasil, are you here with us? Hello, yes, I'm here. Apologies for the delay with the oh, Zoom okay. connection. I couldn't get it to work. Okay, that's all right. Okay, are you ready to start your presentation? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, have, before... have I got um I can share my screen, is that right? Yeah, that's all right. Uh before you start your presentation, is that okay if I introduce you to the participants? Yes, of course. Okay, while you uh, share your screen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I am Indah and I will be your moderator of today's second session. Before the presentation begin, let me inform you how the presentation will be. So to keep the quality of sound functional during the meeting, please mute your microphone. But if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box or later on, if you want to ask question directly after the presentation, use the raise hand feature, then unmute your microphone. So ladies and gentlemen, our speaker today is Dr. Fiona Kassil. She is one of the lecturers at the University of Edinburgh, United of Kingdom. So um, she is uh, one of the senior lecturer in the faculty of uh, senior lecturer in nursing studies, University of Edinburgh. And she also a member of a strategy board community engagement at University of Edinburgh. She uh, quite done a lot of uh, research and she also has been produced several, several books and book chapter in homelessness and social inclusion, homeless and inclusion health, global challenges, local solution. Also, she is productive in writing papers for, uh, for publications, which were published in several reputable journals. For example, uh, the, uh, her recent paper is on the benefits of GP care in outreach setting for people experiencing homelessness a quality study which is published on British Journal of General Practice and some other papers. I will not read it one by one though. So uh, are you ready to start your presentation? Dr. Fiona Cathil? Sorry, I'm just turning swapping screens to turn on my <laughs> okay that's all right okay can can you hear me and can you now see my presentation yes yes we can uh, see your um slide and also hear your voice clearly excellent okay thank you may start your your presentation thank you it's uh thank you very much for the invitation and it is a real pleasure to be with you today. Um, I come from you um, from Edinburgh in uh, Scotland. So I've pointed it out here on the map and um, it is lovely to meet with you. I'm very privileged to be here uh, this morning for me and this afternoon for you. Uh, please let me know if you can't hear me or if you want me to speak uh, more slowly or, or clearer. So um, just to start, some photos from Scotland to introduce my country. Uh, we are a country of mountains, 
of uh, tartan. This is a special material that we uh, wear and of many sheep. And I have been to Indonesia and um, I have seen some of your beautiful country. I was in Yogyakarta uh, three years ago now and it for a nursing conference and uh, your food was amazing and I had a fantastic time. So I bring my greetings from Scotland to Indonesia. I come from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, this is our famous castle in the city, and we welcome many, many international students every year. Um, as I was introduced, I'm a senior lecturer in nursing studies, and my background is in community nursing. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today, is about community nursing and how, as nurses, we can work to improve non-communicable diseases and what we can do to do that. And obviously the context of Scotland is very, very different from the context of Indonesia, but there are many common principles that we can work with together as nurses. And I will be uh, sharing some of my experiences and also discussing some of these principles of um, nursing and public health that we can help to tackle non-communicable diseases at community level. So the University of Edinburgh is a research intensive university. We are engaged in research across many, many areas. So uh, non-communicable diseases, as has already been introduced, I, much of my research is around people experiencing homelessness, people who are marginalised from society, refugees and um, global public health. And before, before I came to the University of Edinburgh, I worked as a public health nurse in the community. So I'll also be talking about that today. So. Um, it is a privilege to meet with you from the University of Edinburgh. Our aims for today are to think about the instance of non-communicable diseases, NCD for short, in the community, the factors in society that contribute to the increase in cases, NCD management in community settings, and that's much of what I will be talking about today, how we manage NCDs in community settings as community nurses. What does that look like and how do we do that? And the context for that, community empowerment and also cross-program cooperation among MC NCDs in community settings. So let's just introduce the global burden of disease for NCDs, non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable diseases we know are constitute a major global health challenge, not only in high income countries. In high income countries, we have been used to NCDs for many decades, but NCDs are now a global health challenge across low, middle and high income income countries, they restrict economic growth and sustainable development. What diseases are we talking about? We're talking about these four major groups, cardiovascular disease, which leads to heart attack and stroke, cancers of all kind, chronic respiratory diseases, so obstructive pulmonary disease largely caused by smoking, and diabetes, type 2 diabetes that is related to obesity. And those are the four major groups we are looking at. At. And now we know in 2020, the World Health Organization published that these account for over 80% globally of all NCDs, of all deaths, are non-communicable diseases. So what we know is that we are not dying from globally from tuberculosis, HIV and malaria, but non-communicable diseases. And recently, mental health, so suicide, 
intentional injury and environmental determinants have all been added to the NCD agenda. But those four categories are really what we're looking at. What is really interesting about NCDs is that they share these four risk factors, harmful tobacco use, harmful use of alcohol, unhealthy eating and a lack of physical activity. And this doesn't matter which country we're talking about, whether it's the UK, Indonesia or any other country globally, that there are four shared risk factors. And that's what we're going to be thinking about when we think about how nurses can work in the community to tackle these risk factors, because this is the area that we will work in as nurses, how we reduce smoking, how we reduce harmful alcohol, how we encourage healthier eating in communities, and how we increase physical activity. And in my work as a public health nurse working in communities, then these were the four areas that we worked on in relation to reducing NCDs. And the big message about NCDs is that they are preventable. We can prevent NCDs. We do not have to live with non-communicable diseases. They are fully preventable. And that is the key aspect. If you don't remember anything else this morning, it is that NCDs are preventable. And so we need to work in prevention and intervention, not necessarily in cure and treatment. We want to work in the field of prevention, because if we can prevent then we don't need highly expensive cures and interventions. If we can stop people getting coronary artery disease in the first place, working in communities in a public health prevention role, then we don't need to pay for very expensive um, cardiothoracic surgery for heart disease, for cancer removal treatment in hospital, in intensive care. So the key theme about NCDs is prevention. And if you're not used to public health uh, discourse and discussion, then what we talk about is looking upstream. And this can be a confusing uh, way of viewing things if we're not used to this. But what we mean when we talk about looking upstream is that if we imagine a metaphor of a river, the river starts in the mountains and it runs to the sea, regardless of the country we are in. And much of our work in health and in healthcare is downstream. Downstream is where the river meets the sea. And often we find that there are dead fish there. And we put all of our energy into treatment and cure for the dead or the dying fish downstream. And that's where the money goes into the intensive hospitals, into high cost and intensive care treatment for heart disease, for cancer in particular. And that's where the financial resources go when we're focusing on existing disease and death. But the metaphor in public health is that we don't focus there, that we focus upstream. And if we look upstream in this analogy, this metaphor, we see that there's a large factory where chemicals are going into the river and that's what's killing the fish. It would be so much better if we closed down the factory, if we stopped those chemicals going into the sea so that rather than having treating the dead and dying fish, we remove the source, we prevent at the source. So when in public health, we talk about 
upstream. This is what we mean. We, we mean that we look at preventing the disease in the first place. And that's where our public health efforts should go rather than in intensive treatment and cure. Now, of course, treatment and cure is always needed, but in public health and health promotion, and in this context, looking at the prevention of NCDs at community level, we're looking upstream. We're thinking about how do we put interventions in at community level in order to prevent the development of cancer, of diabetes type two, of chronic respiratory disease and of cancers in the first place. So I hope that analogy, that metaphor makes sense because that is the key principle for public health. And that's the key principle that we look at at community level. So let's go back in time. If we go back to the year 2000, what we find is that the United Nations developed the Millennium Development Goals. And what was really interesting is that those Millennium Development Goals really included health. They were set in the year 2000 for 15 years to the year 2015. And as you'll see, there were eight Millennium Goals, but number six, they were very much around communicable diseases, HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, also reducing child mortality through the reduction of um, infant diseases, diarrheal disease, and improved maternal health. There is not a single mention of NCDs in the Millennium Development Goals, because at that time, 20 years ago, we thought that NCDs were only the problem of high income countries, and they have been the major cause of death in high income countries. But we didn't see, we as a global health community, that NCDs were also um, becoming the major causes of death for low and middle income countries as well. So at that time, low and middle income countries were seen as um, suffering communicable diseases, but high income countries as NCDs. But what we've learned over the last 20 years is that middle and low income countries suffer a double burden of disease, both communicable diseases, HIV, malaria and TB, and also non-communicable diseases as well. Now, it wasn't until 2011, only 10 years ago, that there was the first high level meeting by the United Nations and the World Health Organization on the prevention and control of NCDs. And that seems incredible to think that only 10 years ago was the first high level summit on NCDs, when now we know, back to my original slide, that 80% of the world's global deaths are through NCDs. So it would be fair to say that we as a global health community have been very late into um, understanding the role of NCDs in global mortality. And in the last 10 years, there has been a lot of work in low and middle income countries to tackle NCDs. So what is the current picture? This is from the World Health Organization. And if you look at this map, you'll see it is the percentage um, of deaths from NCDs. And if we look at the dark blue, we will see that most high income countries then are experiencing over 78% of deaths are from NCDs. But then we look at middle income countries, many in South America, North Africa, Middle East, and we see um, Indonesia here, it are between 67 and 70 77% of deaths through NCDs. So as countries become wealthier, they also experience the diseases of affluence, which are the NCDs. 
So causes of death in England, this was from two years ago, from 2019. So most of these figures are pre-COVID uh, figures, are that most deaths are from cancer, uh, from respiratory disease, um, from circulatory diseases such as stroke and liver disease. And we can see these all relate to liver diseases to do with uh, harmful al alcohol use, respiratory disease to do with smoking, as is circulatory disease and cancers. So they are all preventable because we know the causes. And if we look for Indonesia, we can see projected uh, forecasts. So males are in blue here, females are in red. And we can see the projected uh, death rates through NCDs um, going forward to 2025. The targets are the dotted lines, but the projected reality are the the straight, the full lines. And we can see that for male, it's projected to be 30%, and for females, about 23%. And that is presumably because more men smoke uh, than women do in your context. So again, this is for Indonesia. We're looking at World Health Organization figures here. NCDs overall are estimated to count for 73% of all deaths, 35% of those are cardiovascular disease, 12% of cancers. So compared to England, um, more cardiovascular disease, less cancer, 6% chronic respiratory disease, 6% diabetes, 15% other NCDs and 21% are communicable diseases. And again, we have that double burden of disease. So we don't have that 21% in high income countries of communicable diseases, but this double burden of disease um, for NCDs in low and middle income countries. So if we go back to 2011, when we had the first high level summit, we're 10 years forward for that. What do we know now? We know that childhood obesity is increasing and we know that childhood obesity is one of the key risk factors for NCDs in later life. And this is one of the areas that we really work in as community nurses. And I will talk about our work in schools um, a bit later on in this presentation. We have obviously are all living through the COVID pandemic. And this has actually exacerbated the NCDs. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. We know that this double burden of disease is well established in low and middle income countries. And that this is what we're all grappling with. And we now have the sustainable development goals. So the sustainable development goals were set in 2015 and they're 2015 to 2030. The sustainable development goals work in a much uh, deeper way than the millennium development goals because the sustainable development goals are all about prevention and actually they are about tackling the causes of the causes. So they're about tackling the causes of the causes. They go right back to tackling poverty, tackling environmental factors, education, gender equality, and the non-communicable diseases are written in as part of the sustainable development goals. So this is really encouraging going forward. So the NCDs were included in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with a target of reducing premature mortality for, due to NCDs by a third by 2030. However, the current global rate of decline is not enough 
to make this target. So we know the data tells us that we are not on target to meet this. And of course, we've had a, a COVID pandemic for the last two years in the middle of this. So what is it about these other diseases? It is encouraging in 2021, earlier uh, this year in January, it was the third high level meeting of the General Assembly of the World Health Organization and it was all about prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. So from having come as not really even being visible in 2011, they're now at the top, well, not at the top, we can argue COVID is at the top of the prevention and intervention um, agenda, but NCDs are are really important in the agenda and that is encouraging. But NCDs don't stand alone. So the NCD Alliance published this data and this is looking at the relationship between NCDs at each stage in life and looking at the relationship between NCDs but also communicable diseases so particularly people living with HIV and AIDS and tuberculosis and if we look on the left hand axis we see the relative risk and on the horizontal axis we see the age in years and we can see that as we get older there are different risks at different parts of the life course and to take a life course approach is one way to tackle NCDs um, and particularly in our case today looking at NCDs at community level but they don't stand alone so cancers are obviously more prevalent with people who have HIV and AIDS uh, diabetes is more more prevalent in middle and older age, car cardiovascular disease in middle age and tuberculosis patients are particularly at risk of diabetes and of cancers. So they don't stand alone. We need an integrated approach across the lifespan when we look at NCDs. And it's a lifespan approach that we tend to take at community level, thinking about interventions for the early years, for children in early years, at school age, at middle age, <clears throat> and then for older adults. And if we look at the risk factors, then we see that recent publications um, around the risk factors for COVID, we find that COVID has actually exacerbated, made worse the risk factors for NCDs. So we know that obesity increases the risk of becoming severely ill from COVID. And for many people during lockdown, then they have increased their body weight. They've had unhealthy diets because they haven't been working, haven't been able to necessarily afford healthy food. And um, then there's been, there's a recent study in France that the odds of developing severe COVID were seven times higher for patients with obesity. Smoking, if you're a smoker, you're 1.5 times more likely to die of COVID than if you're not a smoker. Alcohol, we know that harmful alcohol reduce, reduces our immunity and reduces our immunity from COVID. Physical activity. We know that physical activity is associated with a prevention of heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, overweight and obesity. But during lockdown, many of us haven't been able to exercise, to get out, and there have been much higher levels of physical inactivity. Diabetes, if you have diabetes, you're up to three times more likely to have severe symptoms or to die from COVID and cardiovascular disease are, uh, <clears throat> if you have underlying cardiovascular disease, your risk of COVID mortality and morbidity is much higher. Again, for respiratory disease, if you're a smoker or for cancer. So we know that COVID has actually exacerbated and increased the deaths 
from underlying non-communicable diseases. So whether we're thinking about COVID or whether we're thinking about malaria, TB, HIV and other communicable diseases, they need to be considered together because underlying communicable diseases then actually exacerbate our risks of mortality and morbidity from NCDs. And so there's an international consensus now that premature mortality from NCDs can largely be avoided if we bring in interventions, evidence-based interventions. And the World Health Organization calls these as best buys. And these best buys are linked to the sustainable development goals. They are to reduce tobacco use, they are to reduce the harmful use of alcohol, reduce an unhealthy diet, and reduce physical activity. So the World Health Organization estimates that Indonesia can um, save almost 200,000 lives by implementing these best buys. So current tobacco smoking is high, particularly on men, very low for women, but particularly for men, this is the trajectory up to 2025. And the dotted line is the target. And you can see there is a gap between the target and the projection for tobacco smoking. For obesity, we see that there's an increase for both females and males but that women are more obese as a percentage of the population than men. Raise blood pressure, then we can see that for both men and women, it's quite similar. Um, and although the, the forecast is to continue on a slight trajectory, the targets are to reduce. This is all for Indonesia. And so what are the solutions of prevention and control? It's really important, a recent article in the British Medical Journal really emphasizes that one size does not fit all. So the implementation of interventions for non-communicable diseases needs to be really specifically tailored and shaped for that country and for that country. So I'm very aware of that. This is about saying what works and what we know works in the UK and in high income countries, but then those principles need to be translated by local people into the local situation. Although the principles are the same, the actual local implementation is obviously very different. But regardless, then we use a socio-ecological model where we have individual behavior change, interpersonal working with families at a community level, an organizational level, and then a governmental level. And while we're talking about community level interventions, it is all part, we can't really separate those out. Now we know that because in the Scottish context, we have whiskey. Whiskey is one of our major export goods. Whiskey is, uh, we export whiskey to 166 markets around the world. Our export industry is worth 1.14 billion US dollars every year. It is a huge export market for us. But what is whiskey? Whiskey is a very highly toxic alcoholic drink. It's a spirit. And we have many people who ha have harmful alcohol use because of whiskey. So we work in public health sometimes against the economy of our country. And you have that also in Indonesia. In your tobacco industry, your tobacco industry is worth 1.15 billion US dollars. And yet you have very high smoking rates, especially a young 
uh, amongst young men in Indonesia. So in both Scotland and in Indonesia, we have economic considerations that mean that we are producing whiskey for export, one of our biggest export markets, or in Indonesia, producing tobacco for export. And yet, in terms of public health, we want to reduce harmful alcohol use and reduce harmful tax tobacco use. And so any intervention can't come alone. They need to work at all of these levels to really tackle NCDs. So there are many different factors that we need to look at at the health system. Is there universal health coverage in all communities? Because we can't work at community level unless we have universal health coverage in all communities. Are the political structures appropriate so that we can reduce um, harmful alcohol or tobacco use, for example, within political and economic structures that want to increase production of these products for the economic well-being. Who are our target population? And when we work at community level, our target, I'm going to go through, we go through the lifespan at community level and to talk about some of the things that we do. Also culture, minority ethnic groups that are within mainstream populations and who are the main stakeholders. So what works for community health. And I'm going to talk about these different levels, the health and um, education campaigns, interventions in primary care, that's at community level, community collaborations, um, and local community initiatives and projects. So I worked for several years as a public health nurse working in community settings. So what does that mean? What is a public health nurse? Because a public health nurse doesn't exist in all countries. So public health nurses are educated to bachelor level and are registered nurses working in either hospital or in community settings. Now, in our context, we have universal health coverage. Every community has a health centre, and that health centre is uh, where we have a general uh, doctor called a general practitioner, and they are the gatekeepers to the hospital system. So we can't just go directly to the hospital. Everybody must go through a community family doctor, a health centre. And community nurses work in every community with the community practitioner doctors to work in the field of prevention and health promotion. So that's where we work at community level. So we work in community health centres where we are generalists. So we see everybody and then we refer into hospitals for specialist treatment. So the family doctor is called a general practitioner. It's based on universal health coverage in all communities and community nursing, public health nurses work in those community. So every community, every general practitioner health centre has a public health nurse that work at, with different groups of the population and many work in with NCDs and in prevention. So it's all about prevention. So public health health promotion nurses work with groups in the community and those groups are usually defined by the life course. So it might be young parents with children under five and those groups are called health visitors, community health nurses and work with parents around nutrition of babies, healthy eating and particularly mental health 
of mothers around postnatal depression and mental health. There's a lot of isolation and loneliness. So it's working both with newborn babies and also with new mothers, particularly who don't have a lot of family support. So our context is very different to yours. You have many more intergenerational families all living together to support each other. We have many new, particularly mothers who are not supported. Family live a long way away and they are by themselves and isolated. So mental health for young mothers or, or not necessarily young, new mothers is a really important issue for where um, community health nurses work and that's particularly they're called health visitors. Health promotion nurses work with groups in the community and organisations, so both healthcare teams but also other organisations and what we've really learned at community level is that we cannot do all health promotion within a community health centre. So we have community health centres and that's where we do the more medical intervention. So we give treatment for, uh, we give drug treatment for for a high cholesterol, we measure blood pressure and we can prescribe medication to lower blood pressure for hypertension and we can also test blood sugar for diabetes. So at the in the health centres, that's where the more medicalised treatment goes. And many nurses, so I was worked as a nurse prescriber. You don't only administer the medication, but also are specialists and are able to prescribe anti-cholesterol medication, hypertensive medication, and also for diabetes and refer to specialists. So community nurses working in health promotion or public health are very very often nurse prescribers, so can actually prescribe medication as well as administer. And that happens in the health centres. But what we've really learned is that community health has to get out of the health centre. And so we get out of the health centre and we go to many different organisations within the community. So we might go to sports centres and swimming pools. Many people go to swimming pools. It's a cold environment. We go to indoor swimming pools to swim. And I spent many time uh, sitting in the uh, reception area of swimming pools, running, smoke, stopping smoking classes for people in the community. So people who wouldn't necessarily come into a health center, but we went out into organizations. So we ran stopping smoking sessions in churches, in um, community centers, also supermarkets. We have many large supermarkets who run health clinics that people can stop at the supermarket. They can get their blood pressure tested. They can get their uh, blood sugar tested and they can get their cholesterol tested in order to um, really help for them to prevent the development of cardiac disease. So it's all about prevention, but it's about nurses not being in health centres only, but out in community venues. We go to big football stadiums where there are many men. We have some, well, you'll all know, Premier League football teams, soccer teams, and we would go out and we would do campaigns with men around testicular cancer or around stopping smoking. And it's about going out into those venues. It's about going out into uh, sports venues it, where people are gathering to do campaigns and that involved poster campaigns. We would set up stalls where we might give out um, some free information and leaflets and then we could also talk to people one-to-one -one. and it's around these four different areas physical activity if people want advice on how to re increase their physical activity tackling obesity advice on better eating and healthy eating promoting self-care for people who already have long-term conditions and those at risk of cardiovascular disease and you can see how the role of public health nurse 
maps onto those best buys that the World Health Organization talks about. So the really important thing is to move from silos, everybody working in their own bubble. So some silos to synergies. This is the NCD Alliance, and it's really about integrating NCD prevention into our universal health coverage. It's about taking it out of the health centres into the places where people are. One of the places we really uh, work in is around schools as well. So a recent paper um, published in PLOS One, well, three or four years ago, is about the was an evidence, a sin, uh, um, systematic review, looking at the evidence for community health workers for non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries. And they concluded that evidence on the implementation of primary prevention strategies using community health workers is still developing. So there is a lot of evidence in high income countries, but that has to be translated and contextualized within low income countries. And that this is huge potential, particularly for stopping smoking, blood pressure and diabetes control. So we call community care primary health care. It's about working upstream and it's all about prevention. So things that we're involved with as health workers is essential NCD medication, uh, treatment and control. And I've already talked about that role of the nurse. In terms of healthy eating, much of the work that we do is we go into schools and particularly into junior schools and we work with children in junior schools. So we go in and we talk about healthy eating, we talk about childhood obesity, we help to implement um, programmes working with the schools so we can't do it alone. We're often invited in by the head teachers in schools schools to work with the children around healthy eating, around increasing exercise, how children can walk to school safely rather than or cycle to school rather than being driven in cars, how they can increase their exercise during the day um, in schools and working with schools to really educate the children to make exercise fun and one of the really concerning issues that we're seeing in terms of NCDs is poor mental health with young people and that has been exacerbated, made worse during COVID. So really working with young people around improving their mental health in schools. And then we work with the older adults in the community. So we work with older adults, particularly around uh, loneliness and isolation and increasing exercise. So one of the groups we ran was a walking group. That was where everybody came together. We came together in a community centre. We had coffee and we had uh, snacks, cakes, to snacks to eat, healthy snacks. And then we would all go out walking together around the community and it was a chance for older adults to meet each other, to exercise together and to go out together. Now that is possible in some communities depending on the geography, depending on whether it's safe to walk and how you can walk in your community. And in your context, that might be very different depending on the traffic and on the infrastructure. But working with uh, different groups of people across the life course in order to really tackle NCDs. And one of the big areas was stopping smoking. So while governments can work at putting legislation in place to stop smoking in public places, and not only at legislation, but actually to enforce that, because many countries have policies that stop smoking in public places. But of course, we know that unless they're enforced, 
at community level, then they don't go anywhere. So a lot of what we do is stopping smoking sessions. So people come, we go out to shopping centres, to marketplaces, if it's not raining and cold, uh, into churches, into community halls, into schools and talk about stopping smoking. So for children, it's about not starting smoking. And for adults who are already smoking, we have several programs of 10 week programs that we work with people 10 to 12 weeks on a program to reduce tobacco use and to reduce smoking. And we also work with alcohol. So harmful alcohol use is uh, a really important issue. And we work with people who recognize that they experience or, or are a part of harmful alcohol use on how to reduce their alcohol intake. So a program that works from reducing alcohol every day to every second day or from every drink to every second drink to reduce their alcohol intake and the big issue to work is is crisis management because many people manage to reduce their alcohol or their cigarette smoking but when a crisis comes when a bereavement comes then people revert back to harmful smoking harmful alcohol use and it's being there to start the program again and to work with them around that program in the community oops and so most of our interventions in the community are about prevention. It's about working in every community and working to make sure that we prevent. At system level, then our government pays um, the community health doctors to carry out prevention programs. And that's a financial incentive to the doctors in order to test everybody who wants it for high blood pressure, hypertension, for diabetes, and also to offer advice on prevention. So these interventions need to happen at all levels, across the lifespan, and also across the socio-ecological model. So working at community level is the way to really tackle NCDs, and the principles are the same. The role of a community health promotion nurse or public health nurse is really crucial. And sadly, what we've seen during COVID is that most nurses working in public health or prevention have been pulled into working, obviously, for COVID prevention, which has been a global pandemic. And the danger is that NCD prevention has been left behind. And what we're going to see is an increase in NCD uh, mortality and morbidity because of COVID. So thank you for your time. I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have, either about the role of community uh, promotion and public health nurses working here in the UK and in Scotland, um, or anything else about uh, NCDs globally that I might be able to answer. I'll stop sharing my screen. Ah. Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Fiona Casil who uh, giving a valuable insight on NCD management in the community setting, which focus on prevention and intervention. Now we come to question and answer session. Here in the chat box, I have one question from Budenok Wulan. Uh, as you mentioned at the previous uh, presentation, NCD is preventable. In your point of view, is there any possibility to reduce or even eliminate the risk factor of NCD? If so, how to get that or how to achieve uh, that condition? Thank you. Yes, so NCDs are preventable. And I think the main thing is that it needs intervention at all of the levels. It needs intervention at government level. And that is around implementing policies that maybe uh, reduce 
when alcohol is sold, for example, in shops, it's only sold between 10 a.m. in the morning and 10 a.m. at night, reduce the time that people can buy alcohol, re implement legislation on the age that people need to be in order to, is, to buy cigarettes, or, and also um, policies, for example, around smoking, um, so that you're not, um, that there's, that, that policies are implemented because in many places policies are set by governments but they're not implemented so are they actually checking and working with the commercial industry so we used to really um, argue, I guess, with the food industry and now there's much more collaboration of working with the food industry <coughs> so that we have clear labelling on supermarket items, particularly, <coughs> excuse me, on what, um, what is the nutritional content, what has a high salt content, um, and reducing salt in many um, of the products. So there's been a lot of movement in the last 10 years to reduce the salt that is put in to products that many of us buy in the supermarket around cereals, around bread, around everyday basic items so that salt is reduced to reduce cardiovascular disease. So things can be done at national level, at community level, and then at obviously individual behavior level. But I think the two key things that we're learning is that it can't be done by health professionals alone, that doesn't work. And it has to work with many other organizations outside of just purely health. Okay, Does that you. answer your question? Yes, we hope so. <laughs> okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, now we have three person who raised their hand. So first of all, I will give the opportunity to who hand need with Susanti. Please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, Miss Inda, for your uh, opportunity to meet. Hello, Dr. Fiona. Hello, lovely to meet you. Okay, nice to meet you too. Welcome to our country, even uh, online. <laughs> I hope next time you can visit to our country, especially in Malang City. Okay. Uh, we know that tobacco use is uh, NCD in the community, and then uh, on other hand, tobacco is one of the important commodities in Indonesia, and also the tobacco industry contributes significantly to the Indonesian economy, as you mentioned in your uh, PPT, I think, and especially tax and excise as a source of government income, employment opportunity, source of income and regional development. However, uh, tobacco and smoke or cigarettes has a negative impact on health and in the environment, environmental in our uh, country. And also Indonesian cigarette industry is in a dilemma situation. Doctor. And based on this condition, the firstly, uh, could you give us advice or suggestion what will we do as nurse in the community during COVID-19. And then the, secondly, in the future, future, we want to establish it's like a tobacco control center in our faculty. And if you have experience about that, could you share about it? Thank you. Yes, so I can't tell you the solution. It's like I said, I guess about the Scottish whiskey industry that countries produce and, and economies are built on harmful products. So for us, it's whiskey, alcohol, and for you, it's tobacco. And for many different countries, it is different products. So there is always a conflict between the, the economists of a country and the public health departments. And I think just over time, it's 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 trying to work together uh, to say we understand that 
you need to grow tobacco and that that is the industry but actually how can we work to reducing um, NCDs and uh, many of the ways that we've done it particularly through universities is through tackling um, using research in order to really look at the links between uh, harmful tobacco use or harmful alcohol use and NCDs and I think universities can be somewhere that can bring together industry, can bring together practitioners, can bring together activists and researchers to really have a conversation to work in in that space. So there are always activists who are uh, fighting and campaigning against the tobacco industry or the, the alcohol industry, and, and that has its place. But I think within a university setting, it can be a really special place where we can bring together these often different sectors with different perspectives to, to come together, to work together, to find solutions that are going to benefit everybody. Um, and, and I think that can be the real uh, joy and, and what makes university uh, special is to bring together these different uh, sectors that often work in their own silos, their own bubbles and don't speak to each other. Yes, I think so. Thank you so much for your suggestion. Okay, let's move to second question. Uh, Mr. Ahmad Dairobi, would you please to turn on your camera? Thank you. Okay, you can now uh, ask the question. Okay, thank you, Miss Inda, for the opportunity for me. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Fiona. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dairobi. I'm one of nursing students from Muhammadiyah University. Um, okay, where do I have to start now? Uh, there's a lot uh, of data showing that it is estimated that in several years, several years, uh, there will be more people is uh, are suffering with diabetes as well as hypertension or any other com communicable disease. Uh, for example, let's say maybe uh, let's say this year there were one million people are suffering from diabetes, and in the next few years, let's say maybe five, seven, or ten years later, uh, it will be increased to let's say five million, seven million, or maybe ten million. And my question is, uh, can this non-communicable disease really can be stopped? If so, uh, what realization or what outcome has been done? Because the, the data every year, every single year always increasing over and over again. Thank you very much. So yeah, the, the data obviously in different countries is different. And certainly in low and middle income countries, you are right. The data is that NCDs are increasing. Um, but it's only been 10 years in low and middle income countries that we've really realized the impact of NCDs. In high income countries, we've been tackling NCDs for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And so if you look at the data in high income countries, NCDs are reducing. Now, they're not reducing as fast as we would like them, and they're not reducing as fast as we want to hit the uh, sustainable development goals, but in high income countries, incidences of cancer, of coronary heart disease and of diabetes are reducing. So I think to learn some of the lessons, because we've been tackling NCDs for 30, 40 years, in low and middle income countries, tackling NCDs is much newer. So as I said, it was only 10 years ago, the first high level summit. And so it's about, it's not just about community nurses working at community level. It's about having an infrastructure that allows that prevention work to happen. So it needs universal health coverage, every community to have a health facility, then to have developed 
career pathways for public health nurses to work uh, with NCDs, for governments to work at policy level, for communities to work. And then over time, then these do work in terms of preventing NCDs. So I would be encouraged, NCDs are preventable, but, but they need a lot of investment over time at all those different levels. Okay, thank you. Is that uh answer your question? That'll be the answer, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for the answer, Dr. Fiona. Okay, good. Uh Dr. Fiona, I think this is the last question from Pu Angraini because it's getting late now here. Okay, so Pu Nia, please. Okay, thank you, Pu Inda, for this opportunity. Hello, Dr. Fiona. Hello, okay. good evening. Okay, good evening. Uh, let me introduce uh, myself. I'm Nia, you can call me Nia. I'm one of the faculty member of the University of Muhammadiyah Malang. Also my majoring in family and community health nursing. So I'm really happy to see you here even in uh, online. Okay, I already... Uh, heard that you already mentioned about the health promotion project that you done. Uh, is there any barrier or challenge that you find that you find out? And what's your idea to deal it, particularly uh, in pandemic era? So it's it's still a uh, run well even in this COVID-19. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fiona. Yes, so Tackling NCDs before the pandemic, we were really making good progress in high income countries. Our cancer rates were reducing over time. Our, uh, our heart disease deaths from cardiac disease were reducing over time. And most of that was because we were working at the prevention side um, around healthy diets, increasing exercise, drugs in order to reduce cholesterol and um, hypertension. But unfortunately, it looks the evidence is, is emerging, but it's not solid evidence base yet um, that during the pandemic we have gone backwards. So because all the public health nurses were moved into uh, pandemic roles and NCDs, people were locked at home, people were eating unhealthy, drinking unhealthy. Uh, there hasn't been, we haven't been able to do community working uh, because of the COVID risk. Everything has gone online. It's been so much worse. So sadly, it feels like the pandemic has pushed us back. I'm hoping, or we hope, that this has been a temporary pushback and after the pandemic we'll be able to move forward back with our NCD work, but the pandemic has definitely uh, had a negative effect on our NCD work and not only uh, the four areas, but mental health as well. We're really seeing a lot of uh, increased mental ill health following the pandemic. So the, the, the research base is not conclusive yet, but it is. Uh, it looks like it, we've gone backwards. And, and we're not out of it yet. We're still not able, I'm not exactly sure how the situation is with you in Indonesia, but you know, we, we, we can go out, schools are back, we're back in shops and things, but a lot of health consultations are still online. Uh, hospitals are struggling to cope with COVID cases and others. And, and the danger is the difficulty with prevention work is that during an emergency, prevention work disappears and it's the high priority work that happens. And, and that's the real difficulty with the prevention work is keeping that momentum when there's other uh, priorities. Yeah. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fiona. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think we come to the end of our second session. So we want to extend our gratitude to Dr. Fiona Kassil for the informative and interesting discussion this evening. Hopefully we will be able to meet in person in the future. And also, we would like to 
uh, say thank you for all the audience for your active participation. I think that it is enough for me to be a moderator for the second session. Thank you again, Dr. Fiona Kathil. Thank you for your lovely invitation. It's been a real pleasure and privilege to speak with you. I'm very sorry I couldn't come to be with you. Uh, that would be lovely. And uh, my previous trips to Indonesia have been fantastic. So I'm sorry I have to speak from a very dark and wet and cold Scotland this morning. But it really has been my uh, pleasure and my privilege. And thank you so much for the kind invitation. Okay, thank you. Okay, I will give back to Pujvita as a MC. Thank you, Ms. Inda, for your kind assistance. Alhamdulillah, we have listened together to inspiring topics that has been delivered by our two expert speakers. Thus, we come to the end of the whole series of guest lecture panels. We as a host and on behalf of entire committee, thank you very much for your participation. Ladies and gentlemen, and we share apologize if there are any such coming. Let's close together today's event by reading Hamdallah and closing prayer of the assembly. Alhamdulillah, 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 Alhamdulillah,